What is the difference between a covalent bond and an ionic bond? To explain this difference, we first have to go and look at atoms and what happens between atoms. If we go to our periodic table, we'll find that our metals are grouped together in group 1 and 2 mainly. Remember, hydrogen is also in group 1, but hydrogen falls under the non-metals. So group 1 and group 2, and then all of our transition metals are actually grouped together because they are metals. When we look at group 6, 7 specifically, as well as group 5, we know that these groups are non-metals. So on your periodic table, you will notice that these groupings are there for a reason. Our non-metals are grouped together on the right-hand side, and our metals are grouped together on the left-hand side. So very important to remember that. Now when we look at the periodic table, what we are actually looking at is an atom in its ground state. So for example, if you go and you find oxygen, you'll see that oxygen has an atomic number of 8 and a mass number of 16. This is oxygen, plain and simple. Not O2, not O2 minus. This is just plain oxygen. Oxygen is a non-metal. And oxygen can react with some of the other elements on the periodic table. When an element reacts with something else on the periodic table, a bond can form. Covalent and ionic bonds are therefore examples of interatomic forces. Interatomic forces basically means forces between atoms. If I go on an international flight, I am flying from one nation to another nation. Interatomic forces, forces between atoms. There is a third interatomic force which I'm not going to discuss today, and that is a metal bond or metallic bond, but this specific video focuses on covalent bonds and ionic bonds. So a covalent bond, let's look at that one first. A covalent bond exists between one non-metal and another non-metal. Sometimes there can be more than two non-metals, but generally speaking, a covalent bond will be between non-metals. So if we take oxygen, for example, and we go and bond it to hydrogen, hydrogen on the periodic table has an atomic number of one and a mass number of one. When a bond forms between hydrogen and oxygen, this is called a covalent bond. So remember, when we look at oxygen, the 16 that we see there is actually our mass number, and 8 is our atomic number. This number 8 means that we basically have 8 protons in our nucleus. Because oxygen is in its ground state, it must mean that there is no charge on oxygen, which means that it also has 8 electrons. When we go and draw our alpha diagram, 1s level, 2s, 2p, and we place our electrons 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, we see that in the second energy level, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 electrons, which explains to us why we find oxygen in group 6. Because it has these two orbitals that are lacking an electron, oxygen wants to form a bond. So when we draw the Lewis diagram for oxygen, it looks like this. 1, dot, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. We have now placed the electrons as dots around oxygen. Now when we go and look at hydrogen, hydrogen only has one electron, which means that when we go and draw the Lewis diagram for hydrogen, we will have hydrogen and one electron. Now we see that hydrogen and oxygen are sharing a pair of electrons. There is still one unpaired electron around oxygen and another hydrogen can go and attach itself there. And this is an example of a bond between hydrogen and oxygen we call H2O. H2O is an example of a covalent bond, covalently bonded molecule. When we talk about nonmetals, that are covalently bonded, we talk about molecules. 
This explains to us why hydrogen will have two sites where it will bond with oxygen to form H2O. Can something else have bonded to the oxygen? Of course. It's just the example that we're using today. If we then move on and we go and have a look at ionic bonds, we are now going to focus on bonds between metals and non-metals. So when we talk about ionic bonds, it will be between metals and non-metals. An example that I'm going to use will be when we have Na bonding to Cl. If you go and have a look at Na, you'll see it's in group 1, and I'm not going to draw the alpha diagram again. It means that in the outermost orbital, Na has one electron, and I'm just going to draw it as a little dot next to Na. Chlorine is in group 7, which means that chlorine will have seven electrons in its outermost orbital. Now what happens here is not the sharing of electrons like we saw with a covalent bond. What happens here is a transfer of electrons. Ionic bond means that there is a transfer of electrons. So what will happen is Na will become Na+, which means that this electron that was attached to Na is now released. Cl wants desperately to have eight electrons in its outermost orbital, and chlorine will absorb that one electron from sodium. So the electron is transferred over here. Are all electrons the same? Yes. If one electron moves from sodium and moves to chlorine, it is still an electron, regardless of where it came from and where it's going. So what we see happening here is because Na has given off its electron, it becomes Na+. And because chlorine has absorbed an electron, it becomes Cl-. And now we have Na+, and Cl-, and we have these opposite charges on these ions. Remember, an atom with a charge is an ion. And now these ions are attracted to each other because of the opposite charges, and they are going to form an ionic bond. The ions attract each other to form an ionic bond, and we see that NaCl is formed. NaCl is actually Na plus and Cl minus, and we write it like this. NaCl is called an ionic compound. It is not called a molecule. So NaCl gives us the simplest ratio in which Na plus and Cl minus will arrange itself to form ionic bonds. This basically explains the difference between covalent bonds and ionic bonds. To summarize, covalent bond is the sharing of electrons and it occurs between non-metals. Ionic bonds occurs between metals and non-metals and it includes, very importantly, the transfer of electrons.